Good afternoon. It's Saturday, May 14th at APOR's 71st Annual Conference in Austin, Texas. I'm Kathy Frankovic, and I'm about to conduct an APOR Heritage interview with Murray Edelman. Murray has been a president of APOR, and in fact was president of APOR during one of the most tumultuous years in the survey research profession, 2000 to 2001. In addition, he has been extensively involved in exit polling, in election projection, with a career that spans decades with CBS News, Voter News Service, um, and um, VRS, Voter Research and Surveys. Um, and uh, I am thrilled to be able to talk to Murray about his presidential address and about his career um, and about his description of 2000. So, Thank you. Murray, it's very nice to have you here. Thank you. And I should say at the beginning that uh, you and I have worked together um, for a very long very time. Very long time. Very long time. Um, tell us a little about your entree into the survey research world and election polling world. Um, I, you have a PhD in human development, right. which is not necessarily a discipline one thinks of as part of the survey research right. community. Well, I actually got into survey research right out of school. I, in, in those days, I graduated in 1964, and in those days there were weren't even classes in survey research. Uh, I happened to take a class on in statistics, probability and statistics, my last year in school. Um, and I, I should note you were a math major and right, an I was undergraduate. Right, a math major. And uh, math has always been my, my field. Uh, partly, as I was growing up, I was kind of a much, very much of a loner. Um, I, I didn't, I had a lot of issues and I, looking back, I, I know that a lot of it's related to being gay, but it was also, I, I, I didn't, my, I, w I wasn't very good at self-expression and I didn't feel very safe around it. But math had answers. There was correct answers, yes and no. So math very much appealed to me and the whole logical, logic part of it. So uh, as, at, at my bachelor's degree, I, I applied for work. I um, went, I think I got about 40 different interviews at, the, at school at Urbana, and a few people had me in, and one of them was the Census Bureau, and uh, they hired me. Um, just from the interview, I didn't even have to go. They, they hired me, and uh, I made, uh, I was making $5,700, which was a lot of money. To in 1960? 64, 65, yeah. Yeah, and so I, I went to the Census Bureau, and there I discovered uh, survey research. And it was a great place to discover it. Uh, Morris Hansen and, and uh, William Hurwitz uh, were the creators of the field. They, their book, Survey, Sampling, and Methodology, and was, was the classic. I didn't know this until you know, I arrived. Um, and I worked with Joe Waxberg in his di division, um, who was, quite a, was a, quite a giant in the field. You know? And um, so that was my first year, year and a half. Um, and while I was there, I also met Warren McCoskey, who was working there, and I worked directly with Tony Turner. So that, that was my introduction. And it was, it was pretty exciting. It was like a whole field. Um, and uh, turned out I was pretty good. So. And then how long were you at the Census Bureau? Uh, well, what happened is I, I was there. I decided I wanted to... Uh, go into a, I wanted to get a PhD, or at least I wanted to go on. And um, I applied to a bunch of schools and I ended up getting uh, accepted at the best school in the country and they actually gave me money, which was University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So I went there in statistics and not, I wasn't committed to doing survey work necessarily. Although it did, it was pretty appealing. Um, and they really liked me at the Census Bureau. And so uh, for a pretty unusual for them is they, they had me come back for a couple summers. And that's where I got to know Warren better and, and things like that. I, my work at UNC was a disaster. It was so the wrong field for me. And, uh, and it's just one of those things where I, I had this, uh, I went to uh, 
I, I knew that I didn't want to stay at Chapel Hill and I didn't want to stay in statistics. And I went to the, uh, April 15th was I had to tell them what to do, it would tell them if I was going to accept it or not. And I said, no, um, I, don't, I don't want to accept it. And they said, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. And they said, well, why don't you accept it? You can always say no over the summer. I said, the only thing I know is I don't want to be here. <laughs> and so he, he gave me to the um, head of the department. I met with him. And he talked to me for a while and, and said, well, you know, there's this guy, Daryl Bach, at the University of Chicago. You really like him. And I was at the University of Chicago and like that. So that's how I got, ended up in the PhD program. And, but, but I was never really committed to survey work at that point. Um, I liked it, but I, was, I wasn't committed. <laughs> but during that process, Warren had wanted me to go to CB. He, went, he got a job at CBS, and he wanted me to go there with him. And I didn't want to go to New York. And so I kept putting it off, and no, I didn't. And then I did my year at Chicago, and, and Daryl Bach told me he was really sorry, but he lost the fellowship for the next year. So. <coughs> So I talked to Warren, you know, and Warren was really eager to have me, and so he, he worked something out. I was, it was great. When looking back, I was like a little prodigy at the Census Bureau. I had found an error in their sampling method in their current population survey, so they were, they were pretty They're very proud of you, yeah. and they, they knew they needed you, or they knew yeah. that you had yeah, something Warren to contribute here. So, yeah, so he made space. Yeah. So yeah. I ended up at the university. I ended up with Warren doing all the CBS stuff. And then it wasn't really until I came to APOR that I started really, this was my field. So, okay, so you go to CBS, you're working with Warren, you are mostly working on statistical estima estimations? Yeah, projections, election okay. projections. Okay. That was the main, the main thing. Although I got involved a little bit in the, the matoski waxberg telephone method. And also, I was by, very heavily involved in the exit poll. And, the, okay, so this is 19, beginning in 1960. That was 60, I started in uh, November 67, or 1967. And was there ever a period after that when you were not working or, or linked to Warren at CBS no, or it's amazing. nothing? I'm still, <laughs> so, I, 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 some, from 1967 to today. So Murray, we're talking about a 50 year career yeah. that will, well, next year it'll be 50 years from yeah, the time you started be, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's probably longer than almost anybody else I can imagine in, in this, the same in field. The same field. Much, yeah. Now, I've done things like I got a PhD, I became a hippie, became a revolutionary. I did all these things, but I always had a connection with CBS and, and projections, election. So let's talk a little about the early days at CBS. Okay. Um, y you are really developing something that's very new mm -hmm. in, the, in the exit poll. Could you talk a little about your role in that? And, and sure. Well, you know, when I look back, uh, it's, I've had a, uh, quite a role in it. When I, I started thinking about when uh, the, the questions we we're going to talk about, and I thought, well, I haven't really done that much. And then, and then I started thinking about it. Well, yeah, we yeah, have done a good bit, you know? Um, well, with the exit poll, when, um, when I came, uh, when I started with Warren in, in in 67, I remember uh, he wanted me to go uh, on a lecture night in Kentucky. And that's where I learned that he was doing exit polling. And he was doing it uh, in a few of the areas. I think what, in, you know, Kentucky is, uh, I think about 70% is in one time zone, and the western part is, is, it closes at 7. And in those days, 6 o'clock was what we considered the, the time to call the race. So he had some exit poll precincts in the western part and used that as part of the estimate. And that seemed to work pretty well. And, and then in 1968, he did it in a, in a bunch of other states. And it, it, it seemed to do pretty good. So I remember, I think it was in 69 or early 70 or something, I remember just chatting with him because, you know, my, I was sort of there with the idea person kind of thing, you know. And I, and I said, you know, Warren, I think you might really have something in the way of a survey here. You know, you do these pre-election polls. You don't really know if people voted. You're just guessing if they vote. You always overestimate whether they vote, you know, and, 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 and you're off a lot sometimes, you know. And, and here, you could actually interview people. You're going to interview them anyway. 
So you can find out the demographics and, and things like that. And, and he, I remember him saying, well, yeah, but you know, it, the exit polls, they're not that accurate and they've got all these problems. I said, well, you can weight them to the results and they're real voters. Whereas you're, you're doing pretend voters before that. I, I like hearing this story, which I've never heard before. You haven't heard that one? No, yeah. because, um, because it does sort of fit in with the way you've always described yourself, which is you come up with great ideas. You might not necessarily be the right person to do, to do right. all the detail work right. to, get, to get it operational, yeah. but you come up with, their, with those ideas. So should we be calling you the father of the yeah, exit poll and not like. Warren? But, well, I actually <laughs> talked to him. We had a, uh, I took him to lunch on our 40th anniversary. <laughs> which I guess was 2007. This is the 40th anniversary of your our, working our, our together. Of yeah. our relationship or something like that. And I told him a story and he said, you know, he said, Murray, I don't remember that conversation, but I don't remember not having it and I don't really remember how I came up with the idea. <laughs> so that was, you know. Okay. Was that? But, We've got news here. <laughs> yeah, well, in a little bit. But I mean, the reality is uh, usually ideas are a product of Teams. And the people that get credit are the ones that control the money, the ones that carry the idea. And he certainly has done that. So I don't, you know, I'm not, but, but I still feel like, I, you know, it's partly mine. Uh -huh. And I also worked on the, uh, you know, we do a non-interview adjustment. I, I developed that. Um, and then later on, uh, wh after Warren, I did a lot of other aspects to it, like um, the integration with absentees. That became a bigger and bigger and bigger issue. So we developed the absentee poll, how to integrate it together, uh, did research on, you know, how to ask certain questions and things like that. Yeah, so. let's, uh, it, it's, this is a massive amount of, 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 of information and a massive amount of, de of development, but, but um, you, you basically you had an association with CBS News pretty much for almost all of this time, and we'll talk about yeah. VRS later, but um, you had an association for, for all, of this, all of this time. Um, you were there and pretty much involved, if not directly responsible, for a lot of what went on with the CBS News polls, with the exit polls, with the election night projections, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so on. In that period, and this is before VRS was formed, in that period, what do you think were the biggest changes or the most critical developments in the science of um, survey research and, and exit polling well, and election coverage? I mean, what mattered the most? Well, it... Because it, it, this, is, this takes us through like 1990. Okay. Well, the, the main thing that happened is initially we were doing projections based on sample precincts. And then we, uh, CBS started doing the exit poll, we started doing uh, demographics, and we basically did it nationally. And then I think it was 1980 is when NBC started using the exit poll for calling races. So then we started doing it two years later, and that's it. Just kept going and going, and there were, then there was exit polls in every state, and which was good in a way because we then had a lot of data and a lot of analysis of what's going it, on. You mentioned the non-interview adjustment. You, you mentioned the um, it, as one thing that that one development that served to make the process more accurate. You mentioned the movement to deal with people who voted early, who voted by mail, right. um, as another way mm -hmm. of making the the estimate. Are, are those the two biggest biggest things? Would you say, or is there anything else in there that we should be talking about as well? Well, those were the. I think the. There was the, um, during, up until uh, the BRS. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's the, yeah. Okay. I think it was, that, I think that pretty much covered it. Okay. Yeah, there were some newer issues that came along okay. after that. Um, after um, 1990, this was after 1992, um, we had a new player um, and the uh, networks, ceased right. operating on right. their own. Right, at a consortium or whatever. And uh, yes, and so there became a time, there came a time when instead of just working with the people at CBS News, um, and of course occasionally with the New York Times, but instead of working with the people at CBS News, it became necessary to work with four organizations. Right. And then five. And yeah. then five. five with um, 
can you just talk a little about that development because it's kind of important in terms of of, of life today um, and the changeover from single network right. exit polling to this multi uh, network consortium well it, it I tell people that I, my job was more as a political survey researcher because uh, a lot of the job was dealing with these different organizations and these differing needs and it was really really challenging I remember uh, when we first came together we compared our demographics and I think NBC would ask religion what it was basically what were you brought up as CBS was uh, are you uh, AB, and ABC had another religious question and that that went on for a while um, and, and, and age-wise, we all had different age categories. And the exit poll still carries these different age categories. The legacy age categories, the legacy, which, is, yeah. which is far too many age categories than right. you would probably right. choose. ABC if does it in decades. Uh, it, 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 NBC uh, was 65 plus. Every, the others were 60 plus. And, and so all these different breakdowns are still in the exit poll. Now, I, sh I guess we should note that when the RS was formed, it was led by Warren Matofsky. Right. So it was fundamentally the CBS News operation. It was a C CBS News organization, and, uh, and that was through 92. And, and then in, from then on, the, they added the AP, and they also forced Warren out and forced me, not didn't force me in, but they, <laughs> They, they, I roughly took his place, except that they merged it with the news election service, which was doing the um, uh, vote, polling vote for uh, uh, the, the, the vote collection. Vote count. And so that was a whole other political thing, because we had two staffs merged together. And that, that was quite a challenge and yes. quite ugly for a while. Yes. I mean, that, that was, in fact, quite, quite difficult, I think, for everybody involved. And it's really about a decade of your life that was spent right. in this environment dealing with, with multiple that. I had, like, people. five, uh, well, I had, well, I think he was managing director, and then, then, the, then, then later they put in an executive director. So ba basically, I had four, four different bosses over those 10 years, supposed bosses, I mean, in the sense that they were more of the manager, but I had control over the content and what we were doing. So it was a it was an odd kind of uh, environment. W w were you able to keep the product, keep the 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 polling and the projections? Yeah, I think I did good. really well. It was a, it was a real it was a real challenge because there was a lot of political things going on, and so like initially we fought over office space. We fought over a lot of different things. Uh, then at one point he had kind of undermined me and got, got his people in charge of certain operations. You know, there were, there were a lot of different things and challenges that, that went along. But I, I think as, as the election approached, everybody just kind of buckled down and we were, we were good. You yes. know? Well, I guess we have to start talking about the year 2000. And, and, well, before and you do that, I let me add talk a couple about, things. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So uh, while we're on it, then we'll go to 2000. So um, the, the, there were some... One of the chan channels that challenges that came up during that time was the, uh, we call it within precinct error. And that was something I did a lot of research on and never really got a full handle on it. And, and that was always a, that was a real cha challenge with it. But one of the uh, uh, studies that came out of it, which became somewhat seminal, was uh, the work we did with response rate and error. And we had these really nice graphs showing that uh, the, the uh, mean square error was not related to the response rate. And that got a lot of play. I know Bob Groves used it a lot. And I think that that helped in APOR in terms of a lot of rethinking of how we do surveys, especially since response rates were declining so much. And, and this was done in the 1990s, yes? Yes, that 90s. was in the 1990s. The, yeah. the, and I'm, and I, should actually, before we really hit 2000, yeah. talk about you and APOR. When right. was your first APOR conference? Do you remember? Yes, uh, 1981. You did not come to APOR until 1981? 1981. That's when I actually became full-time at CBS. And, I, I, and it was partly watching you and Warren talking about it. And it meant a lot to both of you. And I just got kind of curious about it. And I discovered um, APOR was like um, this it was really cool for me because here I had wanted to be an academic, or at least I had 
that was the direction I was going in my life. Uh, but I got sidetracked with gay liberation and the revolution and everything. And I didn't believe in academia anymore. But yet I still carry those values. And I liked the work, so it was a, it was a really great spot. So APOR just became, uh, that was my profession. That's when I started really feeling, feeling it as a profession. And I got into a lot of aspects of public opinion. I never took a class in it, but I learned a lot through APOR. I learned a whole lot through APOR. So your, your actions in, in APOR, I mean, obviously you read POQ, you came to the conferences, um, and, but you also got engaged in, in, in APOR. Where I got engaged, I did, I did papers, I did things like that. And it really felt, it felt like family. I mean, it was much smaller then. I mean, I think when I went, my first one was Buckhill Falls, I think. And that was like 175 people and, and stuff. And here I, I got to play poker with Norm Bradburn. I don't know, I, maybe, I know I had, I met Bud Roper. And you know, it was like, it was a very okay. casual kind of thing. It was really, really cool. Yeah, it was really, really cool. So you've been an APOR officer. You've been um, conference chair, I believe. Right. Right. Um, and then you were elected APOR president, uh, right. vice president and president right. elect. Um, do, do you have any, any it, it, before you were elected president, any distinctive memories of, of, of becoming engaged, of, of, count, of council meetings, of, of the organization that... Oh, yeah. Well, so we could put it in perspective. Or? Yeah, memories are fine. Uh, well, I s still remember you know, being elected at publications chair, and, uh, th and that was re it was really cool. I mean, I... I felt a real sense of community here. So being on council was really great. I, I really, really loved it. And uh, conference chair, when I, when I was conference chair, it, w it was a labor of love. I put an awful lot of myself into it. And it was, it was wonderful. Here I'd been coming to these conferences, and they were uh, really special. And here I was in charge, and it was really, really wonderful. I put a lot of time, uh, it, when I was, Conference chair, I, I remember I was telling David, our, our conference chair here, I said, I, I knew the whole program, you know, and people would come up and say how great it was, and, and it, I just walked around, and, and I, it was just really great. It was, so, I, yeah, it was a really, really wonderful time. Okay. And uh, I did things, like I, I had, uh, I, I found, uh, I had survey, I had a survey sampling, uh, we, we had our first sponsor of a sponsor of desserts. And, and that has exploded all over the place now in terms of sponsorship. So that, that was one of my great contributions. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, so I want to do like 2000 in, in kind you of- You want to get to 2000. Everything yeah. in there. I mean, no, but, but all of this. We have, we have your APOR presidency right. beginning, um, and we have 2000, and just 2000. We'll just leave it at that. Um, what did you expect in your term as president before uh, 2000, that you would you would actually focus on, that you would you well, would actually. Well, I actually be did quite a bit. I you know I um. So I'm I'm glad to tell everyone what I did as yeah. president. You know, um, well, before when I was elected, I Warren gave me this uh, advice, which was really good, and he said, uh, he said Murray, you know, it's a year, it's not a long time, and it's not a long time to get something done. Plus, there are going to be things that happen that you have no control over. And so you've got to really know what you want to do. And that was really good advice. So I, um, I, 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 st I convened a long-term planning committee as vice president. That had worked really well when I was New York A4 president. And uh, we talked about different things. And, uh, uh, and I remember uh, at one point I'm saying, I wish we could go back to the dances are and shrink the organization, but you know that was. I said it anyway. Uh, but uh, what we realized in that was that um, the uh, a second <laughs> the the one of the problems in the organization is we had Marlene Bednars, who was pretty competent, but was one person, and we there was a real limit on the organization. And the reality is every conference chair had to pray that she would be in good health for the conference. Otherwise, it would have been a disaster. And I, I, I did too. You know, I had to, had to do that too. And, and, and it was that she was on a four-year contract. 
And the way the council is, is there's not a lot of institutional memory so that things come up and hit council and they deal with them. So every council would have to deal with, with uh, in, uh, another contract with Marlene and not have any other, they didn't have much options because you had to do it for that next year. You know? So we realized what had to be done. And um, so we, we, we went into that when I was president. So that was one of the main things I went into. Um, the other was the whole aspect of community, and that's something I've been feeling. And I really pushed that a lot. I, I wrote about it in APOR News. I did a lot of different things. And one of the things I did is I got every council member to start a committee. At that time, there was no membership committee. There was just chairs, but no committee. There was no publications committee. There was just the chair. Uh, there was no standards committee, just standards chairs. And I really pushed and encouraged them to start committees. And uh, before coming here, I just looked at the program. And it's like each one of those has about 20 people in their committee. So I thought, that was really cool. Yeah. You know, so yeah. Yeah. You know everybody contributes a little bit. Yeah, know? this is an important point because it, it, it sort of it points out your responsibility for beginning the professionalization of the, of the yeah, association, in which in, in some ways and which, which certainly continued on, yeah, right. I mean, it, it, it was, it's part of a continuum, but we, we did some really major thing. That was one. That wasn't, say, major. It started something that became pretty yeah. major. Yeah. But the, the real thrust was dealing with the secretariat. That was the big issue. And so, the, and, and it was like a, a conceptual change. Uh, what we realized is we needed to, first of all, get bids decide on a bid, and make it work. And if you think about council as year to year, 50% of council changes every year, that is not going to happen unless there's another level of coordination. And that, that was one of the things that we had this aha moment, you know. And so we actually made a plan out. We, we, we developed the RFP. Um, we thought about different possibilities. And um, I think Diane Colasano suggested uh, a professional group. We looked about different other variations, how other organizations were doing it. So we, we, we sent it out in a lot of different, uh, to a lot of different people. And at, my, uh, at the APOR meeting where I was president, we talked to everybody and we, we made it really clear. We said, we made this commitment. We committed, we sent out this RFP. Your job is to decide. You do not have second thoughts now. You cannot have any second thoughts. We studied this. Half of you were part of this. You, you cannot go back. And, and, and we had uh, Mark involved. Mark Schulman was the, the future. And, and we said, and, and you all have to commit to making this work the next year. And, and that's how we did it. Great. Let's and and that, that made a really big this is a very important. Then this yeah. is a very important period and a very important year. Yeah, it was a very the, big season for the, in April. For the, yeah. for the association. Yeah, and it's, it's just amazing looking at it now and how many different ways, and go, ways it's gone. Yeah. Right. Okay, so you're the it's father of the exit poll and you're father of the professionalization right, of right, APOR. Like, this yeah. is good. Um, the, at least um, for people that yeah. watch this, <laughs> all, all, all three or four. Um, the, no, this is going to get very, very highly publicized. Um, I... I want to address something now and then we're going to talk about 2000 and the election and your presidency. Um, but you also, um, in your presidential address in, in 2001, um, you basically came out to everybody in the, in right. the, in the association. Um, can you say anything or a little bit about um, the status of um, gays and lesbians, bisexual people in, the, in APOR prior to then? Sure, sure. Well, I, I came out myself uh, publicly in uh, probably around February or March of 1970, about six months after uh, uh, Stonewall, mm. and never went back in. Um, and I came out at CBS shortly after that. And so in APOR, I was always openly gay, or at least I was openly gay in the sense of I didn't hide it. I, I wasn't into proclaiming it. I just didn't hide it. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the things is I, um, 
at some point, I think somewhere in uh, the late 80s or so, I st tried to get some people together for dinner. And we did that. Uh, Jeff Henney reminded me, it, he, his first APOR was in 92, and there was a dinner of about five or six of us then. Uh, and uh, I did that somewhat every, uh, every year or occasionally. I, I, whenever I saw people I knew, I would pull it together. And it, was, it wasn't like, People were in the closet, although we were careful. We didn't advertise it. Uh, then later on, we started advertising it a little bit. Um, but I saw so I had an, an impact that way. And um, there's something very, very relevant to that. Is um, last night we had our gay poor. Uh, I I dinner. saw the uh, right. emails and, about that. And I had my mind blown. We had uh, like well, we had about 15 people, which we've had before. That wasn't so great. But I had this idea. I said, let's put a picture on Twitter. And so I, I asked people, I said, what about putting this picture on Twitter? And everyone said, yeah. And I was like, yeah? <laughs> and there was a guy who was there who was straight, who just happened to come because he was a friend of them. And I looked at him. He said, yeah, it's OK with me. And so that was like, that really blew me away, you know? And then the other thing at this conference, is I put together a, a panel of, on gay studies somewhere in, uh, I think, early 90s. And it was, uh, they, they put it like the first day in the, you know, the, the less exposed time. And I went to this panel today at 10 o'clock on Saturday, choice time. And there was this panel, on, and it was a, just a panel on, uh, talking about it. It was, it was yeah. just neat. So, so I've watched that progression, and I've contributed to some. I mean, I've been I've been very open, but I haven't right. been pushing it on right. anybody. No, I mentioned the two, the 2001 presidential address because you you basically state that in the first paragraph or, or right, so, right. and so that would be there would certainly be people in that room who didn't know or yeah had no idea up until then. Um, okay, now we have to move on to that terrain, the, okay, the, so the 2000 that, election. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about the 2000 election because, because it's something that mattered for the discipline. It, it mattered for people at A-Port, critically mattered. I mean, mattered for the news media. Right. Um, it mattered to you. Oh, really? um, and um, we're, we're, of course, we're talking about the 2000 election when Florida was first projected for Al Gore, uh, ten minutes before poll closing mm -hmm. time in the mm -hmm. in the in the western part of the state, um, and then later projected by several uh, news organizations uh, early in the morning at two a.m. for George W. Bush, and then taken back because that election went on for thirty-five days um, until the Supreme Court yep. came to a determination. Um, it was traumatic for a lot of people. It was certainly traumatic for for those of us yes. who were still working for news organizations, for CBS News right. directly, me, me um, and um, and certainly traumatic for you who was running the um, yes, DNS. Yes, beyond traumatic. Yes. Yeah, beyond traumatic. Um, and I, maybe we don't really have to talk about that night or right. or, or how you felt, but it clearly impacted um, y y your what what you may be remembered for, which is your presidential address mm -hmm. in 2001, which was in many ways about that experience. Yeah, that was definitely part of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just maybe short, briefly talk about your experience in 2000, 2001, and some of the things it involved. Okay. Um, congressional I'll, I'll, testimony okay. could count. All right, on, I'll start with yeah. that. Well, I, when, uh, I always, uh, whenever I talk about this, or even related to it, I always tell people, my career peaked at 7.52 p.m. in 2000, November 2000, November 5th, 2000. That was when I entered the call in for Gore winning Florida and committed uh, BNS to that. Um, and I consider that the peak because I was president of APOR and it had been a really great year as president. Everything was going well. The, my work with BNS was great. We had an incredible primary season. Everybody was really happy with what we were doing. Uh, we were well prepared for the general election. And that's when the call got entered. And it was all downhill after that. And that night was just awful. I, around 9 o'clock, I started getting calls. And, and then, and so we had to with, withdraw the call. And that was kind of ugly. Then later on, some of the networks started calling Bush the winner. 
And I, I didn't see that at all, and I didn't. And I was right about that part, but it, it was really embarrassing for everybody the whole, the whole night. And then we spent a long time after that, and it, it was uh, really difficult for me because the, uh, the managers, our, our board of direct, what are we called? Board of managers, I guess it was. Um, they, they put a gag order on me and didn't want me to talk at all. And, and that, was really, that was really difficult. Uh, right before that, I had given a New York Aport talk, and, I, uh, and the AP person was there, and they wrote an article about it and took what I said out of context. That's when the, and then the gag order happened. And that was a real drag because I was going to speak at Maypore, and I didn't do that. And that, that Maypore was where we were having the, the council meeting in Chicago. So that was really hard. And then I watched all the media uh, trash the exit poll for the mistake. And the problem wasn't the exit poll. The problem was in our projection system. And uh, we, you know, we, we had a system that uh, it was based on probability. It was going to be wrong you know, a couple times out of 1,000. And it just so happened that this was, happened to be such a big thing. And, and we need to underscore that at that point in time, um, we, there were sample precincts in from the part of the state, the, the lion's share of the state, which closed an hour before the West, right. which had been closed for more than 50 minutes. Um, and there were also actual vote totals right. that had come in. So there right. was more in this there was more beyond in, and polling. And the exit poll was right on, actually. So the exit poll had nothing to do with the problem. The problem, turned out, was the way the sample precincts came in. And that was a little problem in our model in that we did not have that adjustment in terms of our error. So, so the, mer the, the model was a little bit at fault. And the other part of it was it was a statistically rare event that happened to occur in, in this particular key state in the country. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, here, and also, what the also thing that happened is that here we've been having elections up until that point, and people always thought their votes were counted. No one ever questioned the accuracy of counting, and, and all that was exposed as well. So it was, it was quite a challenge to every, at every front. It's the length of time. We're talking November 5th through a uh, congressional hearing was uh, the 14th of February. Um, right, that's so, when I testified in front of Congress, yeah. Um, which you weren't originally supposed to do. It was supposed to be the six news organization's leaders. No, I think uh, I but was. But you were there, I, and then you were called up, and you were sworn in separately. That's the way it looked. But I was actually, I, I was supposed to be called in, and I was prepped for it and everything. But then when they did it, they didn't, they didn't call me. But then they did. Then one of the, the, rep, the one of the people there did. So, it, but but I was I was I was supposed to be there. To be there. Looking back on that now, that that whole that whole period and that the investigation, because everybody investigated. Each news organization right. investigated what happened. Um, yeah. Paul Beamer um, presented right. at, RTI at Congress. Came. RTI um, yeah, it did was a an real analysis. Awful thing. Um, I mean, RTI came. Uh, the 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 board hired them to do it. They basically took my research and made it theirs, which that was fair because it was good research. But you know, it was like it just felt really, it felt bad to be investigated. You know, I'm it, sure it so, always feels like, bad to yeah, be investigated. It's not a great feeling, and it's not something that um, survey researchers often have to have right, to encounter. Right, right, yeah. So it, it was, it was. Yeah, new, but I had new thoroughly in investigated. I had I explained where everything was, and and they. They did it themselves, and, and they just followed along. Well, it's nice having validation. I mean, it's, it's right. Yeah. No, you needed the outside. Um, I know. So, so did anything good come out of that period, um, either for uh, survey research or for election projections? My presidential speech. Your presidential speech <laughs> certainly came president. out of that, Murray. That was probably <laughs> the best thing that came out of it. <laughs> but for it, me personally, that was the best thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But you know, just. just but and it started on my, like I said, my career, and yeah. now my career is in a whole new place. So yeah. I'm, I'm happy. But it was, uh, it, it, there was no immediate plus. I mean, it, they, a lot of uh, money came out of it, and that money was poured into a new system, and it was, and it was a really bad choice in a lot of ways. And the the next election was even worse because the, the so that was not, not a matter of 
it, that was a matter of process, and and it was a matter of the system. It had nothing to do with the, the methodology method. yeah, or no, the. No, there was or the we should, right, we should right. probably. We did improve say the methodology. That. We did improve the methodology, and uh, the other aspect of it is that there became a lot less competition, and people became a lot more realistic. That's, I guess, one thing we didn't talk about is that initially in the 80s the three networks were competing. Then it, when it became VRS, they just followed what we did. And then, be, then it became VNS, which included DAP, and they followed, except in 94, ABC started doing it themselves, and then by 96, everybody was competing, and then they were competing, and then they were competing, and part of what 2000 was, was people really competing. And uh, after that, they, they pulled back a lot because they, they knew what it was wrong, that what could happen when you made a mistake. Yeah, and, and, and people did, did change rules. I mean, the, the, the issue yeah. of when to de declare a state was closed right. changed um, to deal with those multiple poll closing states, mm -hmm. and, and um, people swore that they would be much more careful right. in the it's future. Not nearly as and frankly, there's been a lot. There have been relatively few. It's a lot better managed now. Yeah, the whole the whole thing is okay. a lot better. So yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, it, you you mentioned before people um, not necessarily uh, believing that their votes were counted properly, and this was the beginning of all of that. To get to the airport convention and your speech, I'd like you to show oh, this the T-shirt, which comes from. Oh yeah. So this was uh, I I brought this to help me get in the mood for this interview. This was the T-shirt from when I was president. And making connections was part of the theme of uh, a lot of what I'd been doing that year about a community. And then this was the slogan at the back. And it says, polling now, was it? Po polling now more accurate than the election itself. Did you get that? Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that was the winning T-shirt slogan? That was the winning T-shirt, yes. Um, and yes. uh, do you know who? No, I have no okay. idea. I don't no either. Idea. And, I have no idea. Uh, so, um, so okay. Now let's talk about about your presidential so, uh, address. Yes. Okay. I just I just want you to, if you can, it's hard to do because it was it was one of the times when the APOR presidential address um, hit a lot of nerves. It hit uh, a lot of emotion, and there was a lot of emotion yeah. about it. Um, and um, you know, now it's it's years later. It's. Yeah, it's I still have people tell me. Fifteen years later, it. They, I still have people tell me they remember it, and it was really powerful for me. Tell us now, yeah. sort of a little bit about the speech. Okay. Just well, summarize. The it. way. Uh, let me say a little bit how I did it. Um, at that time, I was uh, being apprenticed to be a pipe carrier, and so I I had this uh, ceremonial thing I was doing every day, and uh, it hit me uh, like somewhere in January that I had to do this presidential address. So I started uh, as part of my ceremony. I kept just kind of asking, what, uh, "You have what to explain to about? pipe carrier." Oh, okay, well, yeah, I don't want to go too far there. You're not uh, a plumber. It's a spiritual thing. It's a Native American <laughs> tradition. Uh, a pipe carrier. The pipe is a very sacred object, and there's a training that you go <coughs> get into to be be considered a pipe carrier. And so for every day, I had a practice related to the pipe, and uh, and I incorporated my apor speech into it in the sense of I would just keep asking what it is do I want to talk about. And I would just listen, you know, and get things. And, you know, you could say, some people might say it's from God, some people might say it's from there, from there. Maybe it was intuition, I don't know. But it was, I was kind of opening up to a larger sense of myself and what I was trying to say. So, so I, uh, you know, and I also read the other speeches and things. Um, and I w the kinds of messages I got was it felt, you know, I, I, it was personal. I felt like I wanted to really put myself out there. Um, I, it felt like being gay was part of it, uh, but I, it wasn't like I wanted to, hey, I'm gay, because I'd been gay, and, you know, it's not like, I, I didn't really believe that I needed to rub people's face in it. It's not like Aport had been homophobic or anything. <coughs> so I, that, but, but it felt like, if it, if it was relevant, I wanted to talk about it. And as I kept looking and kind of uh, asking for things, I, I, I saw that it was kind of a, a part of it, a real part of it. And it had a lot to do with what 
public opinion meant to me. And it really fit very well into what I studied at, for my PhD. And so that all kind of came together in the presidential address to me. And then I sent it out to people. I did a draft, sent out to you and friends, friends and they kind of helped me make it better. So, so that's what it was. Um, <coughs> you thanked APOR, and you thanked, yeah. you thanked APOR a lot. So um, yeah, one of, uh, well, part of it was uh, when, we, when I was talking about Maypore, um, I had that council meeting, and I was kind of devastated, because this was November 17th. It was like a week, 10 days after the whole thing. And I was pretty devastated. And people, were, the council, they spent a good hour on me, just kind of listening and, you know, and everything like that. <coughs> and I, you know, it really, really hit a lot of my plans for, as president, because it by January, I, I had it back together again, but, but that was a really hard one for me. And I remembered it, and I talked about it in my presidential address. And, and the, the theme of it, one of the themes was about community, and it was how we define ourselves, and the role of public opinion in how we define ourselves. And I, I, I weaved together a bunch of different things uh, from my life and, and from that experience. And I think I was really feeling it because that was a very, very deep thing for me. But I feel it when I'm at APOR. I feel, I feel a real sense of community here. And uh, I, I spoke um, last night, at, uh, yesterday there was a memorial service and I just talked a lot about the people because I knew them and you know, even though I wasn't that close, that was part of, of who yeah. I was. Um, so some of the things I talked about that I, I've even referred to this, to, uh, this weekend um, sorry about the cough. <coughs> Guess you can't plan that too well. No. Was um, I tell people that probably one of the most important surveys in my life was the Kinsey study. I, I discovered the Kinsey study when um, I was 1964, 65. I was just starting to deal with being gay, and I was. Ex I was going off to dirty bookstores and things like that, and I found the Kinsey study. And I had been at the Census Bureau, so I knew sampling, and I knew the Kinsey study was bad sampling. But it was, it was an actual study of homosexuality and homosexuals, and it was like, these people exist, and there's a lot of them. I didn't know how many, but there was a lot. And that really made a big difference to me. It, it, it was like my own personal experience was was much bigger than that, and it it made it more okay, more okay, and I really developed that theme um, in the presidential address. You closed in that you talked about the importance of religion. We don't talk about religion. We don't po necessarily poll about religion. We should be doing we should be doing more of, more about right, that. Right. Are we? It seems like well, Pew is definitely doing more about religion. I'm not sure. You know, it's like. Um, it's, it's, it's at one level when you talk about religion and you talk about the denominations and, and all these different things. But, but religion is also about how you experience the world. And I'm not sure we really capture that. I'm not sure those questions are, are really there. So there still needs to be Yeah, I think, it's, I think there's a lot. There. I mean, I think there's a lot of, well, some of it is the whole transpersonal movement is still it's, it, it, it is growing like A4, but it's got a long way to go. But there, there's a lot of commonalities among religions. There's a lot of commonalities. There's a whole sense of like our non con like we, we're really good with our conscious experience, and you know, we, we know that really well. But it's only about 4 or 5% of our brain. And 95% is at that level of unconscious transpersonal. So there's a lot we know that we don't really talk about a lot. And I think that's, that's a, still a very ripe area. And okay. something I still want to do work with, but okay. I'm not at the moment. Okay, so let's look ahead. You came back to CBS um, in the, in the mid-2000s. Um, you worked at CBS. You continued working on exit polling. You continued working mm -hmm. on election projections. Um, you, you, you've continued doing that to the present day as a consultant mm -hmm. um, for CBS News. Um, are, are we getting better at managing elections and 
projecting elections and understanding elections. Are we getting better? Yeah, we're getting better. Are we better than we were? Or are we the same? Um, I think it's better. I think people are working together more. Uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the major news organizations are working together. I think the whole thing is managed much better. I don't think the risks, people are taking the risks that they did before. So yeah, I think that's in, good. in that sense. And I think the questions are good. I think the exit polls are pretty good. Yeah. Okay. And I methodologically, um, they've, we've adapted um, non-response adjustments. We've yeah, examined it's, uh, it's interviewer in effects. Still hasn't. No one's really solved the, the issue of the error in, in precincts, but it's it's more managed better. I think we've we've done a better job of managing things. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. That, that's true. All right. Okay. So. Um, and um, in terms of the future of the industry and the, the well, in, in terms of, of, of your future, actually, because you've done a lot of other things since you right. yeah, 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 yeah. left VNS. I mean, you've, you've managed a sports poll. Right. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, you know, one of the, um, my major contributions, which we, we didn't get to, but I want to, is the whole measurement of gay and lesbian. Um, and um, that, um, I feel a certain... Um, Oh, I get a little bit of credit for is, is it being on the exit poll since 1990. And, and that required a certain amount of politicking and stuff like that. And, I, and I, we managed to develop the question and managed to get it in on every national questionnaire, which was quite, quite something. And in fact, it's the, only, it's the only thing we have a timeline around gays and gay, lesbian, and bisexual. It's the, it's the, only, it's the only measure like that. And, um, so I think that's, that's been really good. Um, in uh, something like 10 years ago, something like that, I got together with Ken Cheryl and Pat Egan, and we did, uh, from Knowledge Network, we, we got it, did a gay and lesbian sample. And we, we, that, that was the first real probability sample of gay and lesbians. And then Pew ended up repeating it about five or seven years later, pretty much every, the same methodology and everything like that. So I, I, I definitely have a, a stake in that area. And it's been kind of exciting watching watching that grow. Okay, okay. Then the industry in general and survey research, um, you know, it's confronting a lot of problems now that, mm -hmm. that everybody talks about. Declining response rate, um, yeah. difficulties in achieving a real probability sample, right. migration to online work uh, uh, for a lot yeah, of reasons. Yeah, there's a lot, some a lot good, of challenges bad. right now. And I, it, partly at CBS, I got caught in a little bit of stuff with A4, and uh, there's there's a real bias in A4 to a probability sampling, and uh, I think uh, I think there's some new methods that are really good, and 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 uh, that I I think A4 is starting to open up more, but it, it's it's got a little ways to go there yet, but it will get there. But I think that's there's definitely a challenge there, so yeah. Okay, in five years, what, what do you want to be working on? Oh, my. I don't know. You know, it was like I was uh, at this panel today, and I was telling them a little bit about a little of the history, and then they were talking about sampling gays and lesbians. And I, I came up with uh, an idea, so I'm going to work on that. Good. Uh, it's a combination of taking uh, a national sample of gay and lesbians, and partly because they want to be transgender as well, and then do some kind of snowball effect with it, and see if we can, might be able to develop something like that. So I have an interest in that. I'm still interested in, in transpersonal experience, and I, I don't know. I'm still interested in that. So we'll see. Okay. Okay. Is there anything I'm missing? Is there anything I didn't ask you about you that I that should good. be asking really about? Um, I guess the, since you want to talk about my, we talked about my address, there was a, a little more I, that actually came out, because uh, uh, Molly Brody quoted it, uh, Molly Ann uh, quoted it. Um, and I still like that, that concept of public opinion as a voice of, the, voice of the people. That wasn't my idea, but I love the, the concept. And the, the thing that I added was that sense of, that we define ourselves to some extent by what other people think. Public opinion is kind of a measure of what people are thinking. So that the kinds of questions we ask help create our sense of who we are. 
and we, in turn, divide, define who we are and get strength in who we are based on what we're getting from there. So there's a kind of a symbi symbiotic kind of relationship. And I, I was telling that to the, the people around transgender, that we're still coming up with the categories and trying to understand what it is. And, and that's part of people are going to be defining who they are based on a lot of what this is. So it's an evolving kind of thing, which I think is pretty I think exciting. it's a very important point. Yeah. And, it, and it's something that, that is, going to be, um, is going to be important for a very long time. Yeah, the whole question of gender is going to be going on for quite a while. So, OK. Yep. Thank you so much, well, Murray. You. This thank has you. been a, a fun interview. It? And thank it's been you. very nice yeah. to talk to you about these yes, topics. Really. <laughs> thank you so much.